Yeah, Jonathan, this is one of the, I have to say, the most exciting days uh, until the, uh, when, uh, since the project really started uh, of the trading pit. Um, um, you're one of the innovators of electronic trading and I'm really happy that to, to have you here in, in my hometown, Buchhausen. So Jonathan Walden, uh, I think you are the owner and the founder of, of Rhythmic LLC, right? Yes, well, thank you for having me. This is a great town. It's, it's beautiful, as you can see. And it's yeah. been very hospitable and I'm very glad to be here. Uh, for me, it's a very, very exciting thing to have to have you here, to be honest. So I'm really, really <laughs> excited, I have to say. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to talk to you about uh, trading in general, about the history of electronic trading. I mean, you are, for, in my view, one of the really, as I said, the innovators of the electronic trading environment. And I think what I would like to work out with you is really the history, kind of how you started and uh, yeah, how this all basically started from scratch so maybe you can tell me a little bit about that sure well I actually kind of fell into this it wasn't uh, my intention to go and uh, do anything with uh, computers and trading and all that kind of stuff I always liked trading I wanted to be a trader mm -hmm. and uh, I had an opportunity to be invited to the floor of the COMEX a long long time ago when mm -hmm. it was in the World Trade Center and um, I saw real live action in the trading pit <laughs> um, yeah. where they were trading coffee and cocoa and gold mm -hmm. and things like that. And I got to tell you, it's an incredible rush when you see what's going on mm -hmm. there. Now the pits don't exist anymore. There's not that same kind of energy in the few remaining pits that mm -hmm. there are, but um, I got the bug. Mm -hmm. And before that I had a bug because I was always interested in playing cards and gambling and things like that. I used to throw gambling parties and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, so um, that was always my interest. Um, so I decided I wanted to be a trader. I sent my resume out to the presidents and chairman of all the investment banks in New York City. I got some nice interviews, but no jobs. Mm -hmm. So I needed a job. <laughs> okay. And I had been programming computers since I was 14. Mm -hmm. um, in those days, you, uh, you, you punched cards or you, you typed on a terminal and it was saved on paper tape. This mm -hmm. was really archaic mm -hmm. by today's standards. I taught myself some programming languages and I got time on computers and I was just doing some mathematics on the computers. I didn't really understand how it was used. They were used in business. Mm -hmm. But uh, right after college, I was working at a store that sold stereo equipment and they asked me to look into taking over the data processing group. Mm -hmm. I had been working with them during college, so I knew the operation, etc. And for the first time, I saw how you use computers in business. Mm -hmm. And then I decided I would do write some programs to help out that business. And after a while, I decided I was I liked what I was doing. I was good at it, and I was going to move on. And eventually, I made it to uh, to the Chase Manhattan Bank, mm -hmm. and uh, I worked in a group that provided interest rate information and comparative bank analysis up to the uh, the Asset and Liability Management Committee of the bank. And after a while, I decided I wanted to get closer to trading, and I was able to get a job at Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. And it was at Morgan Stanley where I, where I really started to learn about real-time programming. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you have to understand, which was made very clear to me at Morgan Stanley, is that the f one of the first questions by the most important people there, he asked me, uh, do you like video games? And in those days, video games were Space Invaders mm -hmm. and Pac-Man and things like yeah. that. This is, you know, this is like 1988. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I like video games, but it's a game. It's silly. He goes, no. Video games are the epitome of real-time programming. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about like today's games where you have massive multiplayer games and all these shooters right. and all these people. This really hard programming problems to solve, to, mm -hmm. to manage all the, the people and what's going on. Well, it's ultimately data. Yeah, right. So data is data. It's just a matter of what you're going to do with it. Anyway, I got a job at Morgan Stanley, and I was in their group that was providing real-time quotes, and uh, real-time quotes, quotes from around the world, and we were feeding that to the traders in real time, and then they were taking that and submitting orders to various exchanges uh, electronically. So was it back, back in the days, it was already a re electronic trading, and it, it, it went through, I would say, cable lines probably, right, so the data? Well, actually, cable was kind of in, in an infantile state then. You had mm -hmm. what were called lease lines. Mm -hmm. You had modems. Uh -huh. These were like big boxes that, mm -hmm. that dealt with these lines. And, you know, a high-speed line was 9.6K. Mm -hmm. 
right? <laughs> I have a one gigabit line mm -hmm. in my house. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, 9,600 bits per second, mm -hmm. right? And like we had four of them for NASDAQ, right? Wow. Right? And that was like, wow, that's really big, uh -huh. right? Um, New York Stock Exchange had a system called DOT, direct order transmission, and so we could send orders there. We could mm -hmm. send orders to NASDAQ or to various market makers. We had orders going to the Tokyo Stock Exchange and other exchanges. Um, it was really cool, but it was really a small amount of the total volume mm -hmm. of the exchanges. It was still pits, booths, phone calls from, from broker mm -hmm. to broker, but you could make a lot of money with the electronic stuff because mm -hmm. you could get information much faster than anybody else, mm -hmm. and then you could look at that information and make predictions. For example, if you got all the information about every single trade, you could then go and calculate the S&P 500, but more than that, you could calculate subsets of the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. So you can calculate what's happening with banks, what's happening with energy companies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And you could see where money was moving. Mm -hmm. And you could see that faster than the brokers. Right. So then you could submit orders knowing essentially what the brokers are going to see. Mm -hmm. And you could make a lot of money doing that. Mm -hmm. And so that worked out. So was it legal back in the days? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. um, okay. there, there's a small story of where Morgan Stanley made so much money in Tokyo that they called Morgan Stanley in to say, what are you doing? Because they sent the Nikkei 225 up above 32,000, which was a problem because all the systems that were dealing with the price of the Nikkei 225 mm -hmm. were using, I think it was two bits, sorry, two bytes to calculate the number. Mm -hmm. And the most, the highest number it could mm -hmm. handle is uh, 32767. Mm -hmm. So when the number exceeded that, <laughs> all of a sudden they have they have a value for the Nikkei 225 that's negative. <laughs> right? Wow. So this was okay. a problem, yeah. right? So it's like, okay, Morgan Stanley, what are you doing, right? Mm -hmm. So they explained it and then mm -hmm. okay, that was that. Um, so, you know, there are these these funny little things that mm -hmm. happen from time to time. <laughs> but eventually in 1992, the SEC and the Federal Reserve gave Bankers Trust and J.P. Morgan uh -huh. the ability to begin to go back into trading U.S. stocks. Uh -huh. And J.P. Morgan called and said, would you be interested in coming over and, and working with us uh, to help develop a program trading system? So I uh -huh. said, sure, and, and I went over there. And then a colleague of mine followed me. And we developed uh, a set of software that, well, the instructions we were given were from our head trader was, we have to be able to trade anything, anytime, anywhere. Whatever it is. She said, it could be dogs. We don't really care. If there's a market for dogs and we want to trade dogs, your software has to be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, fine. And it was the right it was the right attitude because ultimately JP Morgan doesn't control what's going to be traded. The customers do. So mm -hmm. if the customer comes in and says, I need to trade this on this exchange, we need to be able to hook up to the exchange and trade it. Mm -hmm. So we tried to build an infrastructure to handle data from different exchanges in such a way that if you plug in a new exchange, it, it fits in nicely and seamlessly into the data that's flowing around the system. Mm -hmm. So we built a system for the data to be distributed. Mm -hmm. We built uh, connections to the exchanges to market data and connections to the exchanges to send orders. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it worked very well. And then the traders took our system and they started to do some sort of analysis to see if we were fast or not. Mm -hmm. So they would go and they would send in a basket of orders to simulate the S&P 500. And mm -hmm. the reason why I simulated, I say simulated, is because uh, by regulation, J.P. Morgan was not allowed to trade J.P. Morgan stock. Okay. And mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan stock was in the S&P uh, okay, 500, uh -huh. right? So they had to make a little mm -hmm. modification for that, right? Um, and they would, you know, they would call us down to the floor and say, "Look, we're going to trade this basket." So they press a button. And now orders for 500 stocks go in. It mm -hmm. goes through all the software that we wrote, and you could see how the prices of the individual stocks moved. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they say, "Watch," and you wait a little while, and you see that somebody else is trading a basket because mm -hmm. you can see that the prices of all the stocks are moving. Mm -hmm. And they measured how long it took for our baskets to get filled and how long it took their baskets to mm -hmm. get filled, and there was no comparisons. Ours were in and out in a few seconds, mm -hmm. and theirs were in and out in 30 seconds or a minute or something mm -hmm. like that, which gave J.P. Morgan a tremendous advantage because. Mm -hmm you could see, oh, someone's doing an S&P 500 basket, so you'd know approximately where what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we could come in perfectly legally mm -hmm. because we we're much faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was um, that was pretty cool because, you know, you gotta understand, yeah, we're technical people and we write a lot of software, but there's nothing better than seeing your software at work and the appreciation of it and, and things 
something like that. And, and that's really great. So basically, this, uh, compared to, let's say, this were li was a light year di difference, right? I mean, essentially. I remember there was this one meeting that the head of equities had, um, and he was sitting next to the guy who was his equivalent at Kidder Peabody. Mm -hmm. And the guy at Kidder was saying, oh, you know, our technical guys are so good, uh, we're able to calculate the S&P 500 once every three seconds. Mm -hmm. And our guy said, oh, that's nice, but we're doing it seven times, sorry, se seven times a second. Mm -hmm. So okay. the difference is 21 times. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, and, and we all had the same equipment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like we had any special equipment mm -hmm. or anything like that. It was that for whatever reason, either the algorithm or the method that they were using to calculate was different from ours mm -hmm. or, the, or their understanding of how to make things work faster in a computer was different. Mm -hmm. um, we, pr we prevailed. You could see this in the trading P&L of J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. for the, I mean, internally for the program trading group and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it worked out very well. Mm -hmm. So was this the beginning, more or less, of the high-frequency trading race, maybe? Um, perhaps you could say that, uh -huh. yes. I would say it started a little bit earlier with Morgan Stanley. They really, in my opinion, were the, the at the forefront of electronic trading. Mm -hmm. And um, they were really, they, they really embraced technology as an asset, mm -hmm. as something that is going to make them and their clients a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that they would do is they participated with a bunch of firms that to have an independent firm come in and analyze how much it costs to make a trade. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this, you are told, here's a graph of, you know, say six or seven firms, and this guy is 50 cents, this guy is 35 cents, this one is 20 mm -hmm. cents, et cetera. And uh, Morgan Stanley was always at the bottom. In other words, they were the least expensive. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that then Morgan Stanley was, you didn't know, they didn't know who the others were, mm -hmm. but they knew where they were placed in the group, mm -hmm. right? And what that meant was that Morgan Stanley could either pocket that difference, mm -hmm. or they could offer a lower price to their customers, mm -hmm. or some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. So it was a tremendous competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Plus, it also helped the technology group go to senior management and say, look at all the money that you're pouring into us, mm -hmm. but this is what it's getting you. Mm -hmm. It's turning into real dollars for, for you mm -hmm. and, your, and our clients mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing about Morgan Stanley in those days, is they really embraced technology mm -hmm. and felt that it was an asset. Whereas many other firms may have embraced technology, but they always saw it as an expense. Mm -hmm. And when you have an asset, you want to maximize its value. When you have an expense, you want to minimize it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so sure. your, how you use it and, and your attitude toward it, is com they're, they're 180 mm -hmm. degrees opposite. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can, I mean, can I this was basically, you said 1991? I went to, uh, J.P. Morgan in 1992, so ah, Morgan okay. Stanley was 88 to 92. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, and um, okay, so because w w there are stories or rumors about that, that basically some some companies basically made a tunnel through th uh, through a hill and whatever. So basically, this is tr true stories, right? So well, that is true, but that's much later. That's just much later. That is much later. Oh. That that's more recent. That's in you know 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. 2012, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Was futures trading back in the d days uh, already a thing? Well, this futures trading has been around for, well, ancient times, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. But I think the Bombay Stock Exchange is the first uh, first stock exchange and futures exchange. I mean, I know the New York Stock Exchange started in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. The Bombay Stock Exchange, I think, was in the 1800s. But I think they were. I think for futures, they predate the, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade uh -huh. and the and the CME. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we know from ancient times mm -hmm. there were, I mean, you, know, you just go back to Egypt and the famines that they had, mm -hmm. they started storing grains and then mm -hmm. able to sell it and things like that. So I'm sure there was uh, the, effect, the equivalent of futures then. Mm -hmm. But with respect to technology, in 1988, I also was in the position to take in a data feed from, uh, I guess, well, the various futures exchanges in the U.S. So mm -hmm. at that time they were all separate, CME, mm -hmm. NYMEX, COMEX, CBOT, mm -hmm. they, were all, they were all separate. Mm -hmm. And we could get, we could get this information, um, and it was basically what was happening in the pit. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting thing because I, w at least, it wasn't available to us to send orders to the exchange. Mm -hmm. but we could get the market data. Okay. So we could get the market data. We could display it to the desk, mm -hmm. and then the desk could go and call in mm -hmm. what orders they wanted to do. Okay. So, yeah, you could you could have your data and get it really fast and make your decisions really fast. Mm -hmm. It could flash up on a screen like buy corn at this price or mm -hmm. something like that, but you still have to make a phone okay. call. Right? Okay. So you, you might have had an advantage uh -huh. because you, you had the information of what to do, mm -hmm. but how quickly you could get that information to the desk, I don't know. I mean, a squawk box might work or yeah. whatever. Um, 
and uh, but I don't I know that the firms I was working for did tremendously well in in equities and equity derivatives. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, at J.P. Morgan, the commodities group was using the software that we developed. Mm -hmm. I presume they did well, but it was also s a much smaller piece in mm -hmm. terms of the, the, the contribution to the mm -hmm. P&L bottom mm -hmm. line and stuff like that. Okay, okay. So, and uh, at some stage, basically, you 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 quit the job and basically you created your own company, right? So, in so I met J.P. Morgan in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, in 1994, there was a push to uh, explore. Uh, using personnel based in India. Mm -hmm. I was invited to participate in evaluating some of those firms, mm -hmm. and I did, and I decided to work with uh, a firm called Intersys. Mm -hmm. And um, that lasted for a while. Obviously, it was based on the relationship between Intosys and J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, that relationship didn't work out too well, so that by the end, at least at that time, so that by the end of 1998, Intosys had decided that uh, they didn't want to continue the relationship with J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And they informed me in the beginning of 1998 of this and that my team was going to be pulled. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I went back to India to interview people from other firms. Mm -hmm. I found some people that I thought would be good for a team and uh, went back to J.P. Morgan. I said, okay, I'll work with this firm and here are some people I'd like. And that was in April of 1998. Mm -hmm. Okay, and about a week or two later, the Department of Labor announced all the H-1B visas from India, the quota finished. No okay. more for the rest of the year. Okay, and the rest of the year does the year resets in October. Mm -hmm. um, so, the Infosys team is going to leave at the end of December. I'm not going to be able to work with these guys until, uh, you know, October. What are we going to do? They said, uh, "Well, we'll bring them to London, and you can go and." commute to London. Mm -hmm. okay. So my boss had been commuting to London, and I saw that, and it's like, it's not what I want to do. I have mm -hmm. a family, I want to be with my family, it's not what I signed up for, and I said, I have another idea. And I had floated this idea two years before, and I said, you know, why don't you take my work, and let's spin it off into a separate company, and since you tend to not feel anymore that this is a competitive advantage for you, mm -hmm. the, the desk did, mm -hmm. but overall they did not seem to um, I'll have this company I can present it to other firms on Wall Street mm -hmm. and maybe we can work out a deal about this mm -hmm. and I can continue to support you mm -hmm. and they said okay sounds like a good idea mm -hmm. and then they came back to me and they said they wanted me to they wanted to put the software to um, IBM mm -hmm. and I said look I'm trying to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. I'm working for JP Morgan at that time it was about I don't know 17,000 employees mm -hmm. You're asking me to go to work for IBM, where I'll be this this guy, you know, yeah. hundred thousand yeah, employees. Right. It's it's really not what I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to doing. It's not what I'm trying to do. So they said, well, what do you suggest? I said, well, um, you have a vendor called Omnisys Technologies mm -hmm. out of India, and um, the president and owner of Omnisys Technologies used to be the project manager for the J.P. Morgan account at Infosys. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, I had gotten to know him because mm -hmm. of my uh, my team being at Infosys, and we had become very friendly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he had he had gotten the contract to review the code for Y2K, and he basically also was doing some operational support already. Mm -hmm. So I said, let me talk to him and see if he would be interested in picking up the code and picking up support for this. Mm -hmm. It's he's, They're the best to be able to do this because they already know it. Mm -hmm. So there's no real transition. They're already a preferred vendor for J.P. Morgan, so it's not like you have to see like who mm -hmm. is this company and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And so they said, fine. So I called him up and I said, listen, there's this opportunity. What do you think? And we talked about it and he thought, okay, this is a good idea. So, mm -hmm. so we made arrangements and at the end of 1998, uh, I left uh, J.P. Morgan, joined Omnisys Technologies mm -hmm. and brought with me the code and a contract from J.P. Morgan to continue to support the code mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And that was a really great thing. Yeah, so basically you, you, you came and had the, had the first customer. That's right, yeah. right, right. Okay. So, it, you know, I was always concerned if I ever wanted to leave and go out on my own, uh, what do I do for income during the time between I leave and the time I get a customer? Mm -hmm. Well, here I was able to leave with a customer, mm -hmm. and a great customer, mm -hmm. Yeah. right? And um, so that went on, we actually, uh, our contract removed, re, re, sorry, I'm, 
not saying it right. We it renewed mm -hmm. uh, three times, so mm -hmm. uh, there were three-year agreements. So mm -hmm. it renewed three times. So for nine years, mm -hmm. that that continued, and, okay. and that was very good. Um, so we had that, and that provided a certain financial stability for mm -hmm. the company, so mm -hmm. that in terms of our growth, uh, we knew we had a certain amount of money coming in. We knew what we had to do for mm -hmm. them, and we knew we were capable of that. So mm -hmm. that put us in a situation where we could try and develop some new products, trying to make sales for these products, uh, which we, we did. We mm -hmm. tried to make a new product every year. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much uh, everything we did, uh, nobody wanted. Okay. Right? There was one thing that we did that JP Morgan <laughs> wanted, and that had to do with um, taking emails that are sent by um, programs running on machines in the data center mm -hmm. that spot that there's a failure of some system, mm -hmm and taking the emails and sending it to people's phones and knowing without a doubt that it got to their phone. Okay. And mm -hmm. that's because a lot of the times the systems fail at two in the morning mm -hmm. and the system administrator who gets the email in the regular channel uh, never seemed to respond. Mm -hmm. And it's like, comes in the next day and the supervisor says, so what happened? We had this problem. Mm -hmm. Did you get the email? No, I never got the email. Okay. okay. So we hooked into the Vodafone system, so we could positively say, without a doubt, it went to his phone. Mm -hmm, okay. And so if he turned off the phone, that's a no-no, right? Okay. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, all of those problems went away, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so we built a system around that, mm -hmm. and JP Morgan used that for about two years, and then they built their own version of that. Mm -hmm. And so we had this. We didn't know what to do with it. Uh, we didn't know how. We thought it could be used for emergencies, like when there's a snow day at school, inform all the parents, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, we didn't know how to break into that, so we just sort of put it down. We still use it actually internally, okay. but we didn't we didn't know how to uh -huh. turn it into a really big product. So um, eventually, somewhere around 2003, a group of guys came to us and said, uh, "We hear you have this really great system. Uh, we understand it works for equities mm -hmm. and options. We're doing U.S. equity mm -hmm. options also. Mm -hmm. Can it be used for futures?" And mm -hmm. we said, "Absolutely. In fact." At J.P. Morgan, it, it was being used for futures and mm -hmm. commodities. And they said, great, we, we would like to um, build some front ends. We'd like to do it through your company in India. Mm -hmm. And we would uh, like to you know, come onto the scene and produce a better product from mm -hmm. what's out there. And at that time, there, the, as far as I understood, the, the two systems that were dominating were TT mm -hmm. and PAT systems. Right. Yeah. Right. And these people were running these applications for FCMs. Mm -hmm. And they felt that uh, these applications were not very good. Mm -hmm. uh, th the people who talked to us, they knew a lot about trading, but they also knew a lot about the operation of these kinds of systems and that they were cumbersome and expensive and inefficient. Mm -hmm. And what they wanted to do is introduce to the world a, a kick-ass system mm -hmm. for futures trading. So um, the co our company, we had a company in India of the same name, mm -hmm. Omnisys Technologies, and they, um, they tried to build what, what these people wanted, but one of the things that happens is the customer often gives you some initial specifications, mm -hmm. but it's like surface. It's not enough of what's okay. really going on and no, what it means. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they tried to build what was described, but it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, they had a system that kind of looked okay, but didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So they came back to me and said, um, okay, I, real I realized that we didn't give you enough information or whatever. Do you think you could take it, work on it here in the in the States, mm -hmm. and turn it into something that could work? Mm -hmm. So I said, um, let me take a look. I, I needed a few weeks to take mm -hmm. a look at, at the system. I, even though this was all part of our group, it was handled by a different part of our organization. It's mm -hmm. not something I was, I was okay. handling. So I said, I'll, I'll take a look. And I looked at it, and I saw there were a number of things that, like a lot of things that had to be changed. Mm -hmm. But there were some things that, I said, we'll have to live with for now. It had to do with uh, mostly in risk management and stuff like that. Um, but we, we got things to work better. We got the front end to, to be better. And so by June of, I think, 2003 or so, we, um, we launched with a, a tiny prop shop. Our focus was on prop shops mm -hmm. insti and institutions. And it started to work well. And we then picked up a prop shop that was pretty big in stocks. Um, was just getting into futures. Later they became one of the biggest futures uh, mm -hmm. houses in the world. And um, so that started to work out. Mm -hmm. And as this is going on, at some point, Refco, which was the largest FCM, FCM yeah. especially for retail mm -hmm. traders, 
they they basically went under. So yeah, right. there was like a hundred thousand retail traders that needed a home. And was this was this two thousand eight, two thousand seven? No, no, it was before that. Was it two thousand three then? Right. I'm not sure the year three or four. Mm. Or I remember that because months. FX went down and is the futures the division went down as well, yeah, right? So, yeah. yeah. So when what we did for risk management initially was for prop shops and institutions, mm -hmm. which usually tended at least at that time they tended to handle risk management by quantity limits. Like all right. This account can go a thousand long or a thousand short. Mm -hmm. They don't okay. care what the instrument is. That's it, because those guys had put, you know, ten, fifteen million dollars on account, mm -hmm. and the FCMs could manage it that way. They could also say with the CME, they could put quantity limits in the link to the CME, mm -hmm. so they were mm -hmm. okay with that. So we um, we now needed to understand how you manage uh, risk with margin, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to quantity limits and you know fat finger mm -hmm. things and stuff like that. So we, we learned about that. We modified the risk management and we, um, we produced this system. And it started to work and uh, a broker um, picked it up, a small broker, mm -hmm. uh, picked it up and it really started to work. And they put us in touch with a third party screen developer whose system at that time was designed more, it, what it seemed was it was designed more by a trader for based on his own use of the data and how he would trade. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't really designed for large scale use. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was key is that when we met with these, with the trader and their uh, chief developer, mm -hmm. first question they said is, how often do you throttle the data? Mm -hmm. So we said, what do you mean throttle the data? <laughs> what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So you know, throttle the data, you know, you, you send data every so often. Mm -hmm. said, what do you mean, send data every so often? Are you <laughs> saying that your your customers don't get all the data and make decisions on less than all the data? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, absolutely. There's too much data mm -hmm. to send to a screen. So it's like, okay. I came out of the equities world. And with equities, there's equity options. Mm -hmm. And at that time, about 99% of all market data in the world was US equity options. Mm -hmm. so okay. Let me give you an example. Um, in 1992, uh, we had a Reuters feed, which was giving us 300 messages a second, mm -hmm. which included at the at the open, at the at market the open. open, which mm -hmm. is the that's where yeah. you get the most data, <coughs> unless there's a disaster somewhere, whatever. And that included uh, all U.S. equities and equity options. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. By 2000. So 300 messages a second. A second. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're getting your and messages involve last trade, best bid, or best ask. Okay. There was no market depth on any mm -hmm. of these. Things. For all equities? All U.S. equities and all U.S. All equity okay. options. Okay. So it was, it was data from OPERA, which is the Options mm -hmm. Price Reporting Authority, and data from what was called uh, CTS and CQS. Mm -hmm. Those are the Consolidated Trade, Consolidated Quote Systems. Mm -hmm. okay. Today, they're also known, I think, as the SIP, the Securities Information Processor. Okay. okay so all the exchanges report to them. Mm -hmm. you, you can hook up to them and get this data. Okay. okay? So the market open was 300 messages a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. By 2000, from Opera alone, we were getting um, a million messages a second. Okay. Okay, it just exploded. Mm -hmm. I think it was a million. Mm -hmm. um, and we could handle it. Okay. Okay. So we knew we could handle this. So this is now we're in 2003 or 2004. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at this group with the, the front end, and they're like, uh, there's too much data from, <laughs> from the CME and the CBOT, uh, okay. COMEX and NYMEX. And I, I knew how much data we were getting because we were hooked up to mm -hmm. them. And it was less than 300 messages a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, don't worry about it. Just take our library, uh -huh. incorporate it into your code, and don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay. And they did. Mm -hmm. And it blew them away because all of a sudden I could get every single message that was of interest to a user onto his desk desktop mm -hmm. without destroying the CPU so that he had room to do all the other things that he wants to do, plot graphs, mm -hmm. do, you know, do funny colors and analysis and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. And the order book was the key thing. The order book, which is different from equities because you generally don't see a full order book from equities, mm -hmm. since a symbol in, um, futures trades on just one exchange, right. when you see the order book, that's it, mm -hmm. right? So at that time, the CME was giving us an order book that was, I think, 10 deep. Mm -hmm. In okay. other words, there were 10 bid prices, 10 ask prices, 
And the demo was very simple. They would show it to a user and they would show the, the third party app over like TT or over yeah. CAT systems or some other system. And the order book was moving like this and like this and like this. And then they would show that same app over us. And this was going like this and this. And ours was going like this and like this and like yeah. this. That's it. I five remember seconds, the time. Yeah, I remember the time. Five seconds and yeah. then bingo, it's like, I want that one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was still an easy sale probably, right? That was it. That was yeah. the whole sale. Hmm. Right. So you talked a lot about filtered data, unfiltered data, so because I, I really would like to uh, explain or have you explain this a little bit uh, more. So the user really doesn't, when he has his front end, he doesn't really understand. I mean, he wants to have platform ABC, but he doesn't really understand what's behind that. So you talked about filtered data, which, which basically means, okay, you get a snapshot, which is called every, let's say, every second or half a second, right? Well, yes, it's periodic. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are two things that you have to worry about when it comes to filtering data or aggregating data, as mm -hmm. we call it. So that is, divide the world into quotes and trades. Mm -hmm. right? So for the most part, when people are looking at charts, they're looking at trades. Mm -hmm. So you can't aggregate trades because then the charts are completely meaningless. Mm -hmm. okay. So you have to pass every trade through. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if you look at how much, how many messages you get for quotes and how many messages you get for trades, if you're just looking at top of book for mm -hmm. quotes and trades, it's two to one, typically. Mm -hmm. right? So even though you're getting all the trades, you're only getting one third of the total data. So what you want to do is, since they're not charting the quotes, you could, if you needed to filter or aggregate the data, you filter or aggregate the quotes. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means somehow you're getting information about the current state of the quotes mm -hmm. periodically, like once a second, once every quarter second, once every tenth of a second, or whatever. And um, we, s we do offer that because the reality is not everybody has good bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Some people are requesting data from so many symbols that they're getting a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And with the bandwidth that they have, they can't support all that data. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the machine that they have has, it doesn't have enough memory or CPU or mm -hmm. whatever, or they're doing too much on the CPU. Mm -hmm. So when people uh, come to us and they say, well, the data seems slow, our first question is, are you hooking up to our aggregated feeds? Mm -hmm. Almost always the answer is, what's an aggregated feed? So right. the answer is no. So we show them and then the problem goes away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Um, if someone is more technical and needs to analyze all the quotes, then we, may, we suggest that uh, if the, their current setup doesn't support it, they take space in a data center, they mm -hmm. rent them machine, mm -hmm. either from us or from somebody else, uh, something that is closer with a lot of bandwidth, mm -hmm. uh, or they write their own program and run it on a machine closer to us or, or something like that, and then that problem goes away too. I have one question, so maybe uh, what is more important, bandwidth, latency, memory, CPU, is, is there uh, any, any, any rules that I'm just curious to well, know? Well, I guess the, the, the thing that, you, that would probably be most important to certainly day traders and many other traders is what we call latency. Mm -hmm. And so latency basically is the delay or the time it takes for data that comes out of the exchange to get to the end user. Mm -hmm. right? And it also is how much time it takes for data to come from the end user to ultimately get back to the exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's basically execution reports from the exchange, market data from the exchange, and orders and modifications and cancellations mm -hmm. to the exchange, mm -hmm. right? So <coughs> For many traders, they want that, that amount of time to be as small as possible, yeah. okay? Um, whether or not it makes a difference to them is a different story, but they tend to want it. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're a swing trader and you say, I just buy, I, I'm gonna buy at market at the open and I'm gonna hold it for three days, yeah. latency is generally not such a big deal. First of all, you can send an order in well in advance and say, release this order at such and such a time, which is the open, or you can say, release the order when the market goes open. Mm -hmm. So there's really no latency there, mm -hmm. right? So you can, we offer that. You can say, release the order at such and such a time. So um, that's not a problem. Um, but those guys' latency isn't, isn't so mm -hmm. important. Also, they're looking to make many ticks. Yeah, right. And lowering the latency helps you save a tick, typically, mm -hmm. right? But the day trader, the scalper, who's, you know, either clicking here and there, or he has an automated trading program that, that's looking at the data and firing off orders, generally latency, reducing the latency, reducing the time between him and the exchange can, can have a, a, a benefit. Mm -hmm. 
How much of a benefit is for him to figure out? Mm -hmm. Well, we always say to people who are really interested, a lot of people ask us, you know, oh, I want your low latency fee, right? And our low latency is, is super low, mm -hmm. um, really low. So we say to them, first, take our regular fees mm -hmm. and figure out what you're doing and make sure you have an algorithm that's profitable. Mm -hmm. right? If it's not profitable, check your algorithm because if your algorithm is not profitable, mm -hmm. It will also be not profitable with low latency, right? Right, or it will tend to be. So we we insist that people do that. And then if it turns out after some sort of analysis that they've done that either it will become profitable with lower latency or it will be more profitable with lower latency, mm -hmm. then of course we say sure. Then maybe it's appropriate for you to use mm -hmm. our ultra low latency feed. Um, but there are plenty of people who come to us and say, I want your lowest latency feed, and I want to rent a machine and I want to be as close to the exchange as possible, and it's like, okay, we can do that. And then we find out they're going to use a program, which is a third-party program, and they're going to be clicking to trade. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two things about clicking to trade. One is, even if your program's running on a machine in our data center, which is, by the way, at the CME, mm -hmm. um, what you're doing on that machine has to be sent back to you. Right. So and this travels over, over the internet, you, right? right? It travels so over the internet. Right. If you're sitting in Europe or Asia, you're you know, 4,000 miles away, 7,000 miles away, it's just going to take time. Mm. Laws of physics, speed of light, that's right. it. But put all that away. You're a human being and you're reacting to the data. Mm. So uh, what I say to everybody, I say, go try to blink your eyes eight times in one second. It can be done. It's a little uncomfortable, but it can be done, <laughs> right? But if you do it, now you know that a blink of an eye is 125 milliseconds. <laughs> Okay? Mm -hmm. So my question is, can you look at data and react and click in the blink of an eye? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's it's really hard. Right. right? And that's 125 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So let's say the the distance from the exchange for you turns out to be 40 milliseconds, mm -hmm. right? So if I put you right at the exchange, the best you're gonna get is another 40 milliseconds. But if you're sitting there clicking, you still got at least yeah. 125 or right. 200. Yeah. So we try to we try to point this out to people so they don't waste their time and our time and spend money that's just not going to be good for anybody and then they mm -hmm. get upset and all this kind of stuff. We mm -hmm. really try to advise people mm -hmm. from the point of view what's best for them. Mm -hmm. right? So um, so the answer to your first question is latency is important for many people mm -hmm. but not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now that being said, you need proper resources to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So. If you have a computer, when I say small, I mean in terms of resource capability. If the speed is slow, if the memory speed is slow, um, if you're running a lot of stuff, you're watching videos on your trading computer while you're trying to do stuff and it's mm -hmm. using up CPU, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So first, you have to behave well. In other words, stop doing email, stop watching videos. Trading machines are for trading. Yeah, right, business, right? 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 I mean, yeah. Right? You need to watch email and videos, fine. Other machine, not a problem. And you know, if you can't invest in another machine to do that, then perhaps your trading isn't as um, lucrative or as important mm. to that. I mean, especially today, you can get a pretty nice machine for stuff like that for under a thousand dollars. Not a problem. Now, one of the things that people don't understand is that, yeah, you want a fast CPU, and yeah, you want fast memory, and of course, you want solid state disks, mm. and uh, you want a lot of bandwidth and a good speed on your NIC card. But there's something else that actually really makes a difference, and that's called cache yeah. on the chip. Mm -hmm. And so a cache on the chip is an amount of memory that's on the actual CPU chip okay. so that information goes between the CPU and that cache without going out to the solid state disk or anything like that. Uh -huh. And the more of that you have, the more data can be stored there. And what does that mean? That means if you're running a program and it's not there, then the CPU has to issue instructions for the system to go and get it mm -hmm. from the solid state yeah. disk, right? So the more mm -hmm. you can end up storing there, the less time you have to right. spend going and, and fetching traveling. and things like mm -hmm. that, right? And the more data, like even if it's just data for calculations, so the more the more cache you can get on your chip, mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't really pay too much attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that that makes a big difference that I can have a chip that's running at 2.2 gigahertz, which by today's standards sounds like it's slow. Yeah. And yes, it can pop up to say 3.5 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. 
but it's got, say, 256 megabytes of cache on there. Mm -hmm. And compared to something that has 60 megabytes of cache, mm -hmm. who's running at 4.3 gigahertz, mm -hmm. my 2.2 guy is going to blow it away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Know? Especially for the kinds of programs that run on servers. But even if it's a desktop where you're running a lot of stuff, that's going to be very important mm -hmm. for this. How did this basically in the last couple of years, I mean, we talked about 2003, and I think around, yeah, I, around that time I stumbled over your product. How did, did this really de develop? I mean, in the last couple of years, for example, we, we see a lot of footprint, tra footprint trading, order flow, it becomes more, uh, more, I would say, a common known trading technique. How does this really affect your, 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 your software or basically rhythmic in general? Because I mean, I thought, or I think, uh, that there's the data is looked basically visualized way more in the, in the trading platforms. I think I would say the, the amount of data which has to be handled by the CPU uh, is way more. Is it really, uh, is it affecting your, your, um, your rhythmic at all or is it only the computer who's basically have to be more powerful? Well, the computer, it's helpful if the computer is more powerful, but you can't keep changing computers every day. Mm -hmm. And especially now with COVID, which has affect us, the delivery times of machines, like we buy machines, it used to be we could get a, a really kick-ass machine in four weeks. Mm -hmm. Now it's four months, yeah. sometimes six or seven months. So as, as, as peop there are more people using the system, as there's more data happening in the markets, and so there's more data going through the system, mm -hmm. uh, we may find we need to add more hardware, mm -hmm. more resource. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> if I need another machine today, I got a problem. Yeah. And I can only buy so many more machines in the future, right? I can't, you know, I mean, machines now, the kind of machines we buy now cost $150,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're killer machines and they're mm -hmm. big machines, but we don't, you know, it's not like I'm going to put, I don't have $10 million to put into equipment. And even if I did, I wouldn't want to spend it all now because mm -hmm. by next year, this time, there's going to be a whole new set of machines that are much bigger and more powerful, mm -hmm. right? So you have to manage, you have to manage your, your, your money spent on the hardware and things like that. But what that means is, you need to have software can, that can that can kind of uh, adapt to the problem of more data, mm -hmm. more data quickly, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just the software; it's also the architecture of the system. So mm -hmm. let me give you an example. Um, you see a really pretty car running down the street, like a Ferrari or Lamborghini mm -hmm. or McLaren. It's like, wow, that's really cool. But you're looking at it at first based on the body, right? The paint, the shine—it looks really cool. I want that. That's mm -hmm. really cool. And yeah, you can sit in and you can drive fast. Right? But the reason why you can drive fast is because of the mechanics that are going into it. Yes, the design of the body has something to mm -hmm. do with the airflow yeah. and how that affects, but it's the mechanics, the transmission, the suspension, the steering, all of that that goes into mm -hmm. it, right? right? So that's what we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a front end, and it's a really nice front end, and it's a very good front end, mm -hmm. but we're not trying to be everybody's front end. There are so many platforms out there that uh, do different things, uh, specialize in different things, especially with the footprints and order flow mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They hook up to us and that's fine. But the footprints basically do not affect uh, you as a data provider in this case. Well, in some sense that's true, but in some sense it isn't, and I'll explain that. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden, people are looking more at how much has traded and at what price, whether mm -hmm. that was traded on the bid or was traded on the ask, yeah. right? So they're looking at what is called aggressor side, who's mm -hmm. the aggressor and stuff like that. Now there's some debate with respect to um, what is a trade? I know mm -hmm. that sounds strange, but if I come in and I want to buy 100 contracts of ES at market, mm -hmm. I am the aggressor. Right. Mm -hmm. But I might be filling 50, 50 orders and right. each one to sell two contracts. Mm -hmm. So how many trades were there? It's a good question. Yeah. Well, I think there was one trade. So you was one trade, yeah. Th that's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I came in, 100 contracts, I'm, s I'm buying 100 contracts, mm -hmm. that's it, right? That's the trade. The fact that it filled 50 orders is kind of incidental. Well, it turns out that retail traders don't seem to agree. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to like the idea that, oh, they got 50 trades that were bought yeah, or sold right, at, okay, at this price. Mm, got okay. it. I, it's not for me to say they're wrong. This is what they believe, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. So we provide both kinds of, of data, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So um, so if there are more if there are more trades, like if everyone's doing one lot, then mm -hmm. you're going to have more right. trades, right? Okay. So from that point of view, when it comes time for looking at order flow analysis, um, it may be the case that, um, and I'm not an expert on order flow analysis, mm -hmm. I just want to say that, but it may be the case that now there's more data to look at mm -hmm. because of that, right? 
So we do two things. One is we provide you with the data so you can get every trade and so you can decide for yourself how to do your order flow analysis. Mm -hmm. But we also provide you with bars that are are constructed based on parameters that you give us. So mm -hmm. for example, the simple bar is like a time bar. Right. I want to see what's the open, high, low, and close uh, for every minute, right? Say for ES, every mm -hmm. minute, right? So um, we have open, high, low, close. We have volume. We'll tell you how much was, was traded with an aggressor of the sell, an aggressor of the buy, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. OK, so that's great. Um, but I can also give it to you. You say, I want three second bars. Mm -hmm. So I can do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, people come in and say, well, I want to see tick bars. And I want to see what a, a tick bar is. I want to see a bar that the information is, say, 107 to 175 ticks or 175 trades. So we look for every 175 trades and we strike a bar, right? Mm -hmm. Well, for whatever reason, a lot of these platforms decide that instead of using our bars, mm -hmm. which greatly simplifies things for them, they want one tick bars. So they want every single trade where there's, so the concept of open high and low and close is ridiculous because right. it's just one trade. The volume is the volume. It's either a buy or a sell kind of thing. That's fine. So they want all that data. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And some of these platforms, that's what they do. In the meantime, we've provided them with, if they're really trying to construct a bar that say is 175 ticks, we're saving them the effort mm -hmm. and also the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. If I send you 175 trades, it's 175 messages. Right. So you need the bandwidth and CPU to process that. If I send you a bar, which represents 175 trades, it's one message. Well, that's true. Yeah. So in that sense, if platforms made use of the bar, then the fact that they're doing fancy things with order flow analysis has no effect on us. In fact, we mm -hmm. can make it better for everybody. Mm -hmm. But if they decide that they want to construct the bars their own way and they need all the ticks, then that, that puts more of a burden on us. Mm -hmm. And we don't prevent anybody from doing that. We mm -hmm. just, it's up to them to choose. We just make sure that mm -hmm. they, the designers of their apps know about it and, mm -hmm. and have the choice. Mm -hmm. okay. But it seems that for whatever reason, everybody seems for the most part to want the single tick bars. So we've been trying to optimize how we transmit that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've had some success in that. I think there's some more success that we can, in other words, we can make the message, the messages smaller and so it's less bandwidth and mm -hmm. transmits mm -hmm. faster. So that has been a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. And of course, because there's more trading, there are more trades, and so it becomes more of an issue. Mm -hmm. So you may be familiar with something called Moore's Law. Moore is yeah. one of the founders of uh, Intel, uh, right? CPU. So, mm -hmm. so CPU, uh, or computing power, processing power, doubles every 18 months, and the cost goes down by half mm -hmm. almost every 18 months, right? Well, I don't know what the actual calculation or numbers is, but it's the same kind of thing in the amount of data doubles every so often. Mm -hmm. Like I said, from 1992, and you're getting 300 messages a second for all equities and equity derivatives, mm -hmm. to 2000, where it's a million, yeah. that's a very big increase. Mm -hmm. right? How many messages do we have today, by the way, in, in futures at the open? Do you know? I don't know. I do know that there are times in the middle of the day where for uh, Euro dollars, which is the GE symbol, yeah. half a million messages a second. This is the middle of the day. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It, it's it's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know the C. You know, and we go to the CME and we say, you know, you're sending us a lot of data. They they say, well, how much? I said, we're getting half a million messages a second from you. They said, they look. Said, no, you're not. It's much less. I said, no, you don't understand. When you send us a message, it might have 60 trades in it. Mm -hmm. It's one message for them. Mm -hmm. We have to turn that into 60 messages, mm -hmm. right? Because you need to see every single trade. All right. They didn't realize that mm -hmm. at first. So it's like. This, this is an issue. So mm -hmm. then we have to go and figure out, all right, I get the data on one connection. You know what? I'm going to get it three times, and then I'm going to take connection A, and I'm only going to use, I'm only going to send out certain symbols or certain portion of the data. Mm -hmm. B is another third of it, and C is another third. Okay. So, so each process can keep up and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So we're always, it's not that we're behind the curve in that, but we're always being hit with new surprises of how much data there is, mm -hmm. how much data people want, and then we have to go and figure out how are we going to distribute it and stay current and mm -hmm. things like that. Okay. The hardest part has been we're having a much larger percentage of our user group that is far away. Far mm -hmm. away means they're in Europe, they're in North Africa, they're in Asia. And again, distance problem, speed of light problem, bandwidth issue. And how do you deliver? They have the same data needs. How do you deliver a lot of data mm -hmm. over those long distances and keep it timely? Mm -hmm. So those are very interesting computing problems.
what about for the end user really the ac accuracy of, 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 of the data? I mean, for me, this was basically, for me, the eye opener was ba back in the days when I, when I used your system the first time, I saw that the data was accurate and when I reloaded a chart, for example, I mean, I was just a retail trader, it was the same. So the previous platform, what, what I was using, so back in the days, simply didn't show accurate bars or yeah. accurate uh, candles. And this is, I mean, this is the second topic. I believe that people don't really maybe see or, or they are ta taking this for granted. I mean, it's really, it's not only about speed, right? It's only, uh, it's also about that it's accurate. Yes. Well, when we started to go into uh, displaying bars, mm -hmm. we made a decision as to how we define when a bar starts and when a bar ends. Mm -hmm. And some platforms say that, let's say you want one minute bars. They say the bar starts now. So if you happen to be three seconds into the minute, mm -hmm. your bars are gonna always start at three seconds into the minute. Mm -hmm. right? And we said, well, that's gonna be a problem because if you reload the chart and now you're yeah. at 20 seconds, you're gonna have a different chart, right. right? Plus, if you're conferring with a colleague about data on the chart, you wanna be looking at the same chart. So mm -hmm. you're looking at a chart that started three seconds after the minute, I'm looking at it seven seconds after the minute, we're looking at different charts, right? So what we decided is we're gonna start all minute bars on the first second of the minute. That mm -hmm. way you see the same chart, I see the same chart. Mm -hmm. If you reload it, you see the same chart. Mm -hmm. So th I don't know if we were the first or the only one to do that, but certainly compared to the systems that we looked at, we were the only one doing mm -hmm. it. So that, that addresses a consistency. Mm -hmm. So that, that we felt was very important, and so we do that. Another thing that's very important is... Oh, that's my ride. They're looking yeah, right. for <laughs> <laughs> and From time to time, really, people are jumping into the salt stuff, and uh, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, so another another aspect of it is what we is what everyone refers to as stability. Mm -hmm. right? So unfortunately, if something if there's a break in the data coming from the exchange to us or from us to the end user or something like that, you know the end user will feel it, and mm -hmm. the end user always blames the platform. Right. Right. It may have nothing to do with the platform. There was an example where um, Sprint and Cogent were having a fight. So Cogent said. You're using too much of my bandwidth. Your users are using too much mm -hmm. of my bandwidth. I want more money. Sprint said, no, this is not right. We all seem to agree mm -hmm. we're just sharing bandwidth. So Cogen said, fine, and cut Sprint off. All of a sudden, a third of our users couldn't connect because they happened to be on Sprint, mm -hmm. right? So that's an extreme case, but what happens is if there's a problem with your bandwidth mm -hmm. or your connection to the internet, that will affect your stability, right? Mm -hmm. um, another, another extreme case is, you know, someone's cleaning the house and they pull a plug out to put in a plug for a vacuum cleaner and now your computer stops, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's a lot of that that goes on, but the first th reaction of the user is, oh, this platform sucks or there's a mm -hmm. problem. Okay. I mean, you got servers nowadays all, all across the globe. Back in the days, it was Chicago only, I believe, and now it's basically Europe, it's Asia, it's Chicago, it's... Uh, nah, yeah, everywhere. so we, yeah, it was, it was Chicago first, then we added in uh, Aurora, which is Sumi's mm -hmm. data center, when they opened that up. Then we added in Ireland, mm -hmm. and then we, we just started adding in places around the United States and then all mm -hmm. over the world. So we have mm -hmm. Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Frankfurt. In fact, yeah. we're opening up a data center in Frankfurt yes. now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still issues. To get to Hong Kong, you still got to go across the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. To get to Ireland or Frankfurt, I still got to go across the Atlantic Ocean. Right. So there are these big dis distances. And there are technical issues about sending a lot of data across like mm -hmm. that. Um, I, we won't go into it here, but there's something called the bandwidth delay product, which has to do with being able to transmit data across and maybe having to retransmit it or having to wait to know that the other side got it. Mm -hmm. And because of the long distance, it takes more time. Mm -hmm. So there are these, these kinds of issues. So mm -hmm. for a trading system, it sounds a lot more like computing issues, which mm -hmm. it really is. And that's one of the things that we've had to tackle, and we think we're pretty good at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just want to let you know, mm -hmm. we don't make algorithms for people. Mm, right. We don't say we know how to trade, right? We, we may or may not know how to trade, but that's not our business. That's not what we do. Our job is to get you the data and to get you really good data really fast and to take your orders and handle that really mm -hmm. fast.
But also, and this is one of the other things that a lot of people don't see, I think, or don't realize, is the risk management that goes on. Mm -hmm. Is that we've now developed what is a very sophisticated risk management platform. So if you're dealing with sophisticated symbols, sophisticated trading, like spreads or, or um <coughs> uh, TAS products or spreads on TAS products or options and things like that, um, the kind of risk management that we're using, which is in part, in large part, based on the CME span stuff, mm -hmm. um, allows traders to have more margin available to them because mm -hmm. the composition of their portfolio mm -hmm. makes it somewhat more stable mm -hmm. than you might think. Mm -hmm. So like a simple spread, if you're buying the New York contract selling the, far, you know, the, the yeah. second month, that's a pretty stable set of contracts. So that's a lot better than saying, getting charged margin for two separate contracts, right? right? Well, we have that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really helped the traders who, who trade spreads and options and things like that. Yeah, but you're expanding to other markets right now as well. So I know that you added NASDAQ, I know we're talking about crypto. I mean, this yeah. is a, a topic for us. So, I mean, Rhythmic is not only futures, it's, it's now also, it's crypto, it's FX, would it be an option, I believe, and, and I know that it's an option and, and uh, a lot of other stuff, which is possible. And for us, f the trading pit, it's for sure, we can manage basically the tra our traders. So yeah, so that one of the nice things is that we give you, as the, the broker or the dealer mm -hmm. or whatever, um, the ability to manage your uh, each individual account, mm -hmm. but you also have things like you can have a master account for someone and then sub-accounts, and that gets that gets mm -hmm. in there. We're handling cryptos, which we treat as FX, so yeah. which means we're handling, we can handle FX. We, we have NASDAQ data, and we, we, we handle uh, risk for that, mm -hmm. which is of course subject to the rules of the particular regulator and things like that, and of course we have futures. So it's coming to be a full, s full rounded out system of all kinds of asset classes. Mm -hmm. um, What's your future plan for Rhythmic? So li we it's adding, going multi-market as well, yeah? But do you have any specific plans in mind for, for the brand? Well, I think the, the first thing that we're trying to do is um, round out our risk management so that all these different asset classes can be can be handled. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking to go big time into cryptos. I mm -hmm. mean, we're hooking up with, an, with a crypto exchange, which is principally supporting institutional traders. Mm -hmm. And we're basically saying, we're gonna bring introducing brokers to them mm -hmm. so that they don't have to worry about managing all the little guys, the introducing broker right. does that. Um, and then, you know, if that goes well, then maybe it may make sense to go and get access to cryptos for other exchanges. Mm -hmm. There are lots of legal issues involved. For example, everyone says, oh, I want to hook up to Binance. I can't as an American mm -hmm. or as an American company. So there are issues with that. Um, so that's that's beyond a technical aspect, right? right? Um, you know, so, but we'll, we'll find ways mm -hmm. to, to handle that. When was the yeah, last time you were in Germany? It's a couple of years ago. Uh, 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 I right? think about three years ago, I was in Berlin. Oh, right. You know. But I got to tell you, I was in Frankfurt once a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. and I was in Berlin, and now I'm here. And so I've never been in the countryside, or mm -hmm. what I would consider the countryside. Right. This place is gorgeous. Yeah. And, and you know, day, night, with the castle in the background, this, the storybook stuff, I mean, this is, what a great place to be. And the people here are very nice. The food mm -hmm. is great. I mean, it is, you just walk around. It's come, you know, I felt like last night I was walking around alone late, mm -hmm. you know, late at night, and it was completely safe. It was very comfortable. And... Um, you know, I feel really good here, and I, and I like it. I, I got to say, though, if I were sitting here with a desk, looking over and doing my work, I'm not sure how much work <laughs> I would get done. It's just too pretty. I would just be staring out there. You know. mm. so thank you. Thank you very much. Well, for thank for you very much here. for having me. Yeah. It's been really great. It's, it's really an honor. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you.